And I am going to turn off my, um, my video here so that you won't be looking at me uh, because I'll get distracted here. Okay, great. Thank you. Keep those. Uh, keep keep typing in those things as you join and things that you're doing. We're going to get ready to go. We have a very short evaluation at the end of this, which I will put up the link for. And I would just love it if you would go there and just take uh, three minutes and tell us what your feedback is on these, because we do do these once a month, and we want to make them useful for you. Uh, yes, I don't know what the live chat, what's going on with the chat. You will be able to follow because I can see everything that people are typing. So uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, hmm. if it's set to all rooms or if it's set to this room, try all rooms and see if that makes a difference. No difference. Bummer. Uh, OK. This is where the learning curve kicks in, because this is our second month doing these. And every month, we, we seem to be challenged with a slightly different um, set of problems. And I'm positive that this has something to do with what I've, the way that I've set it up, although I don't think that I did anything different. Uh, Except, let me, let me just try one thing here. Okay, well, I don't know what the problem is. I apologize for that. I don't, I'm not sure exactly why you wouldn't be able to see what's going on in the chat box, but I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, if folks could type their questions, and please feel free to type it whenever it occurs to you. Don't wait um, till the end, because I can always scroll back up and find it. And then um, if I don't see your question, and you really want an answer right away, go ahead and raise your hand. And that um, there's a little tone that sounds, and that'll be a sort of a secondary reminder. Um, it could be, Jen. I'm not sure. There's a little, there's a drop down box underneath where it says send to, and that little drop down box is on my machine, it's set to all rooms. It's a drop down box. Um, Yes, I can. Good question, Mary. Mary uh, has asked if the copies of the presentation are available. Where I post the recording, I will also post this PowerPoint presentation and a couple of other supplemental op uh, materials that might be useful to you all, along with my email address so that you can um, catch up with me if you have specific questions we don't get a chance to address. Um, and again, it's useful if you type in your email address into the chat box, then I'll have an easy way way to uh, go ahead and contact you and let you know the web link for all of those things. But um, either way, you can always send me an email afterwards as well. You've got, I've typed my email address in there. So it's according to my clock time for us to get started. And um, thank you all for being here tonight. It's, um, this, I'm Mary Peabody. I'm with uh, UVM Extension and the Women's Agricultural Network and the Vermont New Farmer Network as well. And I'm thrilled to be here. Um, we should be able to get through the materials that I'm going to um, talk about tonight in probably about you know 35 to 40 minutes or so, which should leave a, a bit of healthy time for discussion and question and answer. And so, you know, as you do have questions, please do uh, feel free to um, 
to uh, type them in, and we'll we'll take as many as we have time for. Um, as I said, we are recording the session tonight, so this session will be available for you to review and for others to review as well. Um, I'll also put this PowerPoint presentation there for you to take a look at, um, as well as some supplemental materials that, as we go along, might might prove helpful for you. Um, I think I've covered the general orientation. Um, type in your your questions into the chat box, and we'll do the best we can. And if I, uh, for some reason, don't see your question, feel free to, uh, you know, clap or raise your hand or using the icons, and I'll um, I'll eventually catch up with you. I promise. I won't forget about you completely out there. So uh, this is a brand new way of learning for all of us. So thank you for um, helping us to sort of get our webinar series launched. <coughs> OK, so here's the thing. Tonight we're going to be talking about pricing. And there really isn't any more uh, important topic, I think, than pricing your products properly and learning how to really sort of crack that nut around um, what, what is a fair price to charge that ensures that you're going to actually walk away with a profitable business. So tonight we're going to be talking about the importance of setting prices based on your actual costs. And we're also going to address some factors that can affect pricing and some often overlooked considerations. And remember that a good pricing strategy is a critical component of a profitable business. And it's usually considered both an art and a science. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. You'll see why I'm, why I'm going to say that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, three terms that, that very often get sort of confused, and most of us want our customers to be happy. We also harbor a great passion for the products that we sell. That can lead to some emotional attachments that get in the way of good pricing decisions. Uh, so let's first take a look at these three terms that sometimes get used interchangeably, but actually have some very different meanings. Uh, cost is actually meant to refer to the sum of the expenses incurred in producing an item for sale, while price, on the other hand, is what the consumer is asked to pay for that product. In the best case scenario, cost and price may be equal amounts, but often they're not. In addition, there's also the concept of worth, which is an emotional and intrinsic value placed on the item by either the buyer or the seller. And this happens a lot to, especially to small scale farmers and to artisans and to other people who really put their heart and their soul into producing a quality product. Um, and they have a great intrinsic value that they place on that. And it's very difficult to, um, to take that to the marketplace and, and have people actually vote with their dollars as to whether they, they see it as having the same value as you see it. Um, and I'm sure all of you can relate to exactly what that feels like when you finally put your product out there on the table um, and have to convince somebody to actually pay the price that you've attached to it. Um, <clears throat> you know, so it's, and it's equally difficult to have a potential customer debate with you about whether your product is worth the price that you're charging. So as I said earlier, pricing is both an art and a science. On the science side, it boils down to a really simple equation. It's labor plus expenses plus materials plus overhead plus profit. And that should equal your selling price. So that looks easy enough. Um, and how many of you um, use a, a formula similar to this in figuring out your prices? Just go ahead and raise your hand quickly if this looks familiar to you. OK, some. Great. Excellent. All right, well, then that already puts you a little bit ahead of the curve. So we're going to keep moving forward here. And we're going to talk about factors that affect pricing. And this won't be news to you, any of you, I'm sure. Depending on the type of product that you produce, there are a variety of factors that can affect your pricing. Certainly, your production and harvesting costs will play a major role. The quality of the product will certainly affect your price. Lower quality products come with the expectation of lower prices. Likewise, the selection of the product that may impact the price a buyer is willing to pay. If you'd like to see this in action, all you have to do is go to a big grocery store and watch uh, grocery store shoppers in the breakfast cereal aisle where there's about a 1,000 choices of different cereals. 
Uh, location obviously plays an important role in pricing. Goods and services are just more expensive in some parts of the country than in others. And even in a state as small as Vermont, um, there are regions of the country where there is just not a lot of disposable income to be had. And then there are other areas where there is a fair amount of disposable income to be had. So that's, that's a consideration. It's also related to the next, um, <coughs> excuse me, to the next uh, thing which are the factor that of customer income and demographics. Um, and you probably know by now if you're already selling products to your customers, you know what your target customer is, or I hope you know what your target customer is, and what their income and demographic uh, profile actually looks like. Um, volume refers to the amount of a product that you're able to sell and refers to the economies of scale. It just costs less to make a thousand sweaters a month than it costs does to make ten, and there's just economies of scale that some bigger companies are going to be able to capitalize on. That if you're a smaller grower, you're not going to be able to do as well. So you're just going to have to figure out ways to factor this all into your pricing. So this is, you know, this is sort of the Walmart effect. Demand and supply are basic economic principles. If you have the first strawberry of the season or the first ear of corn, you can pretty much charge whatever you'd like since there will be many more buyers interested in that product than there is product available. Likewise, at the peak of the season, many fruits and vegetables are so common that it's hard to sustain a premium price. Uh, for you meat producers, you certainly know that there are there are cuts of, the, of every animal that are uh, that are far more premium than other cuts, and then there are cuts that are less attractive that you really have to struggle to move. Those don't all command the same price, and it would be great sometimes if they did, but that's just not the reality. Um, what other sellers are charging is going to certainly affect your price. Um, customers are normally willing to overlook minor price differences, especially if they have a relationship with you, the vendor, but that grace will only extend so far. So the reality is, is you really do have to have your products priced um, within what is what we commonly refer to as the pricing window, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go. And the single biggest factor in your pricing decisions should always be your operating expenses. Your costs just have to get covered if you're going to have any hope of sustaining your business over the long haul. Um, so um, please don't fall into the trap that so many growers and producers uh, that I've worked with over the years have fallen into, which is go to the market, walk around, see what everybody else is selling their product for, and then uh, charge that without doing any further um, research on what you really need to raise. Uh, two people producing the exact same product will frequently have very different costs of production, um, and your pricing strategies are going to have to reflect those costs. Um, and there's uh, some reasons why that may be the case, and we can certainly discuss that. Um, and we're going to move into a, um, talking about two different categories of expenses right now, so we'll get into that a little bit. <clears throat> so um, since we've stated that costs are your primary driver in setting your price, let's talk a minute about how to capture and record expenses. Most of your production expenses will fall neatly into one or two categories, fixed expenses or variable expenses. Just as their name implies, fixed expenses refer to those costs that remain constant regardless of your production volume. And common fixed expenses include what mortgage payments, loan payments for equipment or livestock, utilities, insurance premiums. Um, variable expenses are those that fluctuate as your production fluctuates. Examples of these expenses include feed, seeds, seasonal labor, packaging supplies. While most of your expenses will be easy to categorize, there's almost always going to be a few that are kind of fuzzy and fall into that gray area that could go either way. And this is really business dependent. So it's not, um, you're, you might think of something as a variable expense, and I might be in the same business across the road and think of it as a fixed expense. And it's not that uncommon. In those situations, it's not critical which category you assign them to. The critical piece is that you be consistent over time in your record keeping. because 
those you. Um, review your records over time to set prices. It's going to be really important that you're consistent in, in the way that you um, assign them. So the more cost that you place in the variable category, the more conservative your pricing strategy will be. Um, okay, so I see we've got a couple questions. We'll just take a break here and we'll see what we can kind of... Uh, how do we place the value on our time? Okay, um, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. The short answer is I wish I could tell you that um, every small scale farmer will recoup all the time that they invest. Uh, the truth is, is that's probably not going to happen. But my argument is going to be I think you should go ahead and include it when you're figuring out your price. I think you should pay yourself a fair wage. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it would be a fair wage, um, that it would be the same wage all the time. So uh, the way one farmer has explained what they do to me is, is that when they're out in the field and they're doing things that um, some of their hourly laborers could just as easily do, like weeding or harvesting or washing or packaging, they call that time um, whatever they they pay those folks, so that could be $10 an hour, it could be $8 an hour, it could be $12 an hour. But when they're inside, when they're making customer calls, when they're doing um, the books, when they're doing projections, um, they, they allocate that time as a higher fee because they figure that's not something that, they're, that their hourly wage employees are going to be able to do. So Chris, are you, are you, you've got equipment, fuel, and labor here, are those... Um, examples of, uh, are you wanting to know what they are or are you proposing that they're uh, variable or fixed? The variable depending on harvest timing, right? Okay, and labor is is one of those tricky ones because there's some uh, in some businesses you might have to have some labor, uh, a, a, some certain level of labor, regardless of how big or how small or how much you produce or how little you produce. Whereas in other businesses, it really is very directly correlated to the level of production. So again, it's over time you just it's it's more important that you be consistent than it is that you get it into the right um, quote unquote box. So if there's no other questions for now, we'll, we'll keep forging ahead. I want to talk now about tracking your costs. Um, I do know that nobody goes into farming because they have a passion for sitting at a desk and doing paperwork, but you've really got to make some effort to try and track your costs. Good record keeping is the essential element in good pricing. You have to understand which expenses, both fixed and variable, are associated with your products. And the best way to do that is to have a list of the expenses associated with your product and keep the list as complete and accurate as possible. If you have a business that produces multiple products, then many of your expenses will have to be averaged out across all the products, and we'll come back to this in just a minute. By keeping careful and accurate records, you'll be able to see clearly where you're most vulnerable. In this way, you'll be better prepared for any pricing fluctuations that have the potential to impact your business. For example, if you have a livestock operation, the cost of feed will almost certainly be a major expense category for you. If the price of that feed should increase even 5 or 10 percent, that could impact your cost of production tremendously, depending on the size of your business. Um, if the price of that feed should um, I'm sorry, if you, if you have a flower shop and you deliver flowers um, or you sell at markets that are very far away, then a sudden increase in the price of fuel may cause you some problems and you may have to adjust your, your pricing. The point being that the more aware you are of your key expense categories, the more prepared you'll be to adjust your prices as necessary. And please don't be afraid to adjust your prices. People have asked me in the past, well, you know, should I, you know, it's halfway through the season. I don't feel like I should change my prices right now. And I say, if you know that you've, your costs have changed, you, you'd be doing your customers a disservice if you don't change your prices. Because you're not going to be a long-term sustainable business and they're really counting on you to be there. Um, this, the second really big category that uh, you really need to get a handle on is tracking your labor. 
It's common for small business owners and farmers to ask if they should include their labor, and we just had a question about that. And the short answer is absolutely yes. The reality is, is that you very well may have to compromise on how much of your labor you get to cover, at least in the early years of your business. But you should track it and record it so that you'll have an honest understanding of what your products crossed. And a useful tool that you can use for this purpose is a labor log. And I'll put an example of one up that you can download on our website along with the recording of this. Um, it's a very simple little thing that you could actually even just clip onto your calendar in the kitchen and just jot a few notes down on. If you get into the habit of jotting down what you've done every couple of hours, you'll find that most of your time can be accounted for. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, a partial log is better than no log at all. When you're working at a task that benefits several products, average your time across all the products. For example, if you spent four hours today working on a marketing brochure for the next season for your farm stand, and there are multiple products that are going to benefit, then divide that four hours across all of your products. While you're tracking your labor, be sure to use the labor for other purposes as well. It's a great opportunity for you uh, to track your equipment usage, which will be a great help in assessing how many equipment hours to charge to a particular product. And that'll help you be more efficient in the maintenance and repairs of that equipment as well. So you really, you know, figure out ways that if you're going to actually sit down and make yourself do the work of, of uh, jotting down what you've been doing, that you can get double duty out of it. So it'll be, it'll be useful to you if you can force yourself to do it. I promise it'll pay dividends in the long run. OK, pricing strategies. These aren't going to relate to you necessarily, but they are things that in the direct market world, consumers have come to um, understand just because you know uh, commerce is everywhere in our world. And so I just want to say and put them out there, not because I think that they're useful for you necessarily, but I just want you to understand what they are. Um, you know, Skimming the cream is basically offering a unique product when there's a strong demand and allowing for higher prices. Uh, penetration is setting those prices low, and this is sort of the Walmart effect. Setting prices low to enter the market as quickly as possible and gaining a high volume position. Um, these pricing strategies are used, used in large industry sectors, and while they don't often apply to small farms and home-based businesses, it's useful to mention them so you have a broader understanding of what cons customers have been trained to expect. Um, <coughs> Basically, uh, market penetration only works when the seller has access to a really large volume of product. OK, what your pricing says, uh, your pricing speaks volumes about who you are as a business. Um, and as I said earlier, there is a, um, there, there is a concept of a pricing window. Um, you will quickly uh, develop a reputation as a strong and ethical and fair and honest business person if you have a good pricing strategy and you can explain to your customers why they're, why it is that you're charging a certain amount um, for a particular product. Um, you always want to strive to be um, as honest and fair and ethical in your dealings with your customers as possible. Um, if you're able to explain the factors that go into your pricing decision, your business reputation will be enhanced. And you know, your customers aren't going to kick that much about um, small increases in the price over time if they have a relationship with you and, and if you've been communicating to them what it is that you, um, you why, how you set your prices and why you, you choose to do it the way that you do it. And particularly because most of us, um, you know, who who are buying local from farmers that we know, um, we want those farmers to have a good quality of life. We want them to stay in business. We want to support what it is that they're doing. Um, now, you know, interestingly enough, um, there's research done that shows that people, customers, um, if a price is too high, obviously they're not going to be able to buy it and they will walk away from the product. But the research indicates if the price is too low, they're also equally as likely to walk away. 
Um, and the reasons you probably can imagine why um, it just it has to do with quality, it has to do with um, how old is this? Is this stuff that's just about ready to um, expire? Am I going to get it home and find that you know while the top layer of strawberries or apples look perfect underneath, they're all rotted and moldy? Uh, you know, so just it's just a word to the wise for those of you that are just getting started in this and figuring out this pricing thing is do be careful of pricing too low because that's just as dangerous as uh, pricing too high is. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, just summarize what the elements of pricing that we've covered so far. Um, by the time you get to your product to market, you've absorbed some costs, both variable and fixed, and hopefully you've included some profit into your calculations. By dividing that cost into the number of units that you've produced, you'll arrive at a per unit price. Now we get to the art of pricing. We have to assess that price in the light of the reality of the marketplace. This means comparing our price to what our competitors are charging, and it means that we have to assess whether the profit per unit is reasonable given the volume that we'll be able to produce. In other words, we have a price, but we have to determine whether that price can stand up in the marketplace. So before I move on, anybody have questions about fixed costs and variable costs, or is that relatively clear? Clear. OK. So when you're comparing your prices to those of competitors, keep in mind that you want to make your comparisons with similar types of markets. So if you have a pick-your-own operation, you want to compare your prices to other pick-your-own businesses in the area. Also remember that small fluctuations in price are to be expected. So if you've done your calculations and you find that your prices are in the ballpark of the competitions, that's the best case scenario. If that's not the case, then we're going to discuss some things to consider in just a couple of minutes. The next thing you have to examine is whether there's enough profit per unit in the price to make the work worth the effort. Business owners need to understand the concept of return on investment. Ideally, you want the resources that you invest into your product to repay at least what the same amount of money would have returned to you if you had invested it in some other opportunity. Uh, there are a number of factors that will affect how you choose to factor this investment in, but you owe it to yourself to at least consider what using that money is costing you. So as you're investing money to get your product to market, you really want to be clear about the fact that you're, this, is, this is cash. This is, this is, these are scarce resources that you're investing um, in the form of your time and your money. And you want to make sure that you price your products in such a way that you're going to get some of that back. So, and finally, you need to consider whether you can produce enough units to A, satisfy your customers, and B, provide a reasonable profit. And um, this is related to another unit that I teach on break-even calculations. But basically, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to figure out, um, for example, eggs is usually a good example, because you have a certain number of laying hens. They're going to lay a certain number of eggs. Um, if you sell those eggs, um, can you sell enough of them? Can you sell enough of those dozens or half dozens of eggs at the price you need to get to be able to, to say that that is a reasonable return on your investment? <coughs> OK, so now the more common situation. Uh, it's frequently the case, particularly for new business owners and new farmers as they're getting started, that you'll discover that once you have balanced the need to recover your costs with the need to fit into the marketplace, that the amount of profit is just not adequate. Um, and so here are a few possible solutions that you can consider. And I would invite you, after we uh, review these, to see if you can think of any more. Oh. The first one is, of course, um, can you produce more? Can you increase your volume? If you're covering your costs and making a little bit of profit on each unit, then increasing your volume might work for you. 
if you have a number of products, you might considering, consider focusing more of your time on the products that are generating the most profit and decreasing or eliminating those that are dragging your profits down. And that's why it's really important for you to um, take the time to actually have, your pro um, have each of your products priced independently of one another so that you'll know um, which products are actually making you the, the best return. All business owners should review expenses on a regular basis with an eye toward avoiding expense creep over time and to ensure that your prices are still appropriate. I know that what I'm saying is, is sounds like an awful lot of paperwork and I wish I could say that if you just did it once you'd be all set, but unfortunately as the cost of your inputs change, you're going to have to continue to go back and check those records. The good news is, is that once you've done it once and you've set up the system, whether it's a, an Excel spreadsheet or um, a notebook with that you do with a uh, pen and paper, um, it gets easier. So it, each successive time you do it, it'll be um, a little, the result will be better and it will take you less time. Uh, another option is to rethink your market niche. So can your product be repackaged for a different target customer? Can you resize your product in a way that will appeal to a larger audience? Check your marketing plan to see if there are other marketing options that will increase your product's visibility. And a good example here is, um, again, with eggs. Uh, if you have a lot of people in your market or in your region that are selling eggs by the dozen and you think that you're, the price you're going to have to charge is going to scare away customers, then why don't you sell them by the half dozen? Uh, likewise, if you set up uh, next to somebody, you know, if, if the person in the next stall at the farmer's market next to you is selling uh, tomatoes for two seventy five or three dollars a pound and you need to charge three seventy five a pound, then don't sell them by the pound. Sell them by the piece, sell them in small baskets, um, sell them, you know, sell greens by the ounce. Uh, get away from things that are gonna gonna put you in direct visual competition with the people that you're in competition with. Um, and finally, uh, if you've explored all the other options, you may have to rethink your commitment to your product. Well, there are times when it makes sense to sell a product that's not earning the most profit. It's never a good idea to sell a product that cannot even cover its costs. No matter how much you love your product, you may have to pull it if it just proves a drain on your business. And it looks like we have a question here, which I will... Um, Oh, looks like we have a couple questions here. Uh, my competition's charging more than I am. I need to increase my price. Is it better to increase my price slowly over several years or all at once? Um, I would say, uh, and I would invite the rest of you, if you have an answer to that question, to please type it in because, you know, you're all experts and uh, we can certainly all share. My advice would be um, you probably... It, I mean, it, I guess it depends on how much the jump is. If it's, you know, if it's a huge jump, then you might want to see if you could do it over um, a, a period of time. Um, if it's not a huge jump, then you may want to just go ahead and um, bite the bullet and do it. And you're going to lose some customers, absolutely no doubt about it. It's painful. I wish it weren't true. But every time you increase the price of your product, um, it just is, uh, it's a fact of life that some number of customers are going to fall off. But if, again, if you're honest, if you're ethical, if you do good consumer education, if you talk to those people about your customers, about why you have to do this um, and what the cost would be to your sustainability if you didn't do it, um, you may very well pick up some new customers. And of course, it's all about the quality too. I mean, all of this, the underlying thread and all of this is the assumption that you're producing the very highest quality product that you can. Uh, and then Chris is asking, we sell hay and we consume hay in our business. Am I correct in assuming that I must value the hay that I'm consuming the same as if I sold it? Really good question. And some of the rest of you may have similar things. If you, uh, if you make cheese and you have the animals on the property, so you're making a farmstead cheese, you may be wondering, you should be selling your cheese business, the milk from the animal side of things, and what's the price that you're going to sell? Um, 
I would go ahead and plug in the uh, price, the, the same price that, that you're um, selling it for, and sell it to yourself at that. If that price puts you way out of the ballpark, then you may that would be a place where you would have room to do a little bit of negotiation with yourself. Uh, so you could feel free to give yourself a um, an owner's discount or something. But in general, it's better to start off with the market value because that's the value that you could get it if you weren't using it yourself. That you that it actually it would bring to you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody want to agree or disagree? Feel free. So we're getting close to sort of, I'm just going to give you um, some tips and then we're, we can just sort of open this up and do uh, uh, take some more questions and I can share with you some experiences from the um, uglier side of pricing. Um, so to sum up, some practical tips. On pricing, pay close attention to your record keeping and remember that costs change over time, so keep tabs on those changes as they happen. Keep up to date on changing market trends as that can affect what consumers are willing to pay. Um, so do keep an eye on what's going on. Um, if you're short on cash, you might want to consider some barter arrangements to help your cash go further. Um, I do have to say, though, that do remember that um, as far as the IRS is concerned, bartering is a cash transaction. So um, just so that it goes on record here, um, you, you should be keeping records of all your bartering. But it does help your cash go further. And when you're new um, and cash flow is a problem, every little bit helps. Uh, knowing who your target customer is can help you figure out the best way to sort of package your product for quick sales. Keep in mind you always have a choice of whether to sell your product by weight or by unit. If you want to differentiate your product in the marketplace and avoid direct price comparison with similar products, then a good idea is to package your product in uncommon sizes. Again, you know, we sort of discussed this. Um, consumers are used to seeing eggs priced by the dozen, but there's nothing that says you can't sell a half a dozen or four eggs or even sell eggs singly by the piece. Um, if you have a lot of customers that are single um, or smaller family units, then sell things that are in smaller priced, smaller packages. Um, a single person is unlikely to want a whole chicken, but might be interested in a quarter or half a chicken. And interestingly enough, they will be interested, they will be willing to pay more for that convenience. Likewise, if your customers seem to be larger families, then offer bulk packages. Be creative in your approach and it can pay off for your business. And, okay, so here's a few more thoughts about pricing in general. Um, never undercut prices to gain customers. It will alienate for you from your peers and it will be unsustainable in the long run. Um, aside from the fact that it's just a really bad business practice since we have a real problem in this country with people undervaluing food as it is. Um, Really important point to consider, um, which I don't think affects anybody here, but um, if your business is a sign line or supplemental to primary family income, you should still price your products just as if your business depended on the income. It's only fair to those out there who really do depend on the income. And Vermont is a bunch of micro economies that can get messed up really quickly. Um, Thirdly is find ask competitors for advice about pricing ideas, but be sensitive about it and respect their decision on what they choose to share. Um, another common sense one in a really small state where it seems like everybody's related to everybody, never ever gossip or criticize your fellow business owners. It'll do more damage to your own business than it will to anyone else's. Um, and I've seen this happen in farmers markets before where people have said, oh, I wouldn't buy from so and so because, you know, I don't think they really do grow all their stuff. Um, you know, it really just comes back to stick on you. Um, people who are not 
um, ethical business owners, the market will take care of them. You just have to trust that it will. And finally, never ever apologize for your price of your products. Your product should be the highest quality that you're capable of producing. If it's less than that, it should not be in the marketplace, or if it is, it should be discounted to reflect the quality. Your prices should be determined based on the actual cost and the research in which you're being a fair and honest business owner. And it looks like we've got a couple of questions here, and now is your chance to go ahead and uh, type in any more questions that you have. I'm going to take us, I think, in my, yes, well, there's my email address. If you, um, if you want to contact me, if you didn't get a chance to uh, put your email address in, we've, we're going to still be here for a while. I'm going to go, whoops. Hmm, I thought I had my own oh, in my. All right, well let's get some. Let's take some of these questions here. Uh, okay, we increased our price per gallon for raw milk, and a couple customers dropped off when we spoke to them. They told us they couldn't justify the new price, so they could. Uh, Oh, that's a great story. Okay, so so this is a story about people who origi initially were thinking that they couldn't deal with the uh, a higher price. Um, so you gave them a, a, an option to keep paying the older price, um, and then they um, voluntarily started paying the new price. And I think that's something that you can probably do in the raw milk market. It probably would be harder if you were at a farmer's market with lots of competition around you. But um, I think these are the kinds of things. It's I mean, it clearly points to the fact that you have you're building good relationships with your con your customers, and that's what you really want. Um, we have another question about: Would you um, recommend separate bank accounts for the separate pieces of business? Um, for example, selling meat to a value-added side of the business, particularly when they're separate managed. Oh, um, I, I would in that particular case, Jen, I would probably suggest having separate bank accounts. Um, the other way that you could do it is if you do your bookkeeping using um, a program like Quicken or QuickBooks, you could, uh, you could actually set up two different um, profit centers there. And even though the money was coming, was flowing in and out of the same account, you'd always have a sort of a running tally of who owes who money. Um, but I'm a big fan of keeping as much of the, f the money flow separate as you can. Absolutely keep your business separate from your personal. And if you're running multiple businesses in the, um, out of the same residence or off the same farm, uh, you might even want to con consider keeping um, separate accounts for those because it can get ugly. Um, quickly, particularly when they're family members. Um, so other questions, comments, things that have worked for people on pricing, things um, even tangentially related to pricing that you're interested in. Um, how many of you have had, and you can indicate by just raising your hand, how many of you have had an um, opportunity to uh, uh, have to raise your prices? So quite a few of you. Almost annually, Chris says, yeah. Um, so well, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that you're addressing um, that you're you're changing your prices and that because I think too often we let it go and it's just it's a lot easier somehow just to uh, get into the habit of going um, to the market and just uh, using the same old prices and hoping that it'll somehow all sort of work out in the wash and. Um, I think that all of us would agree that the cost of our inputs have not gone down over time by and large. They almost always continue to go up. Um, annually is a good time to do it, but don't be afraid to do it. Um, 
but don't be afraid to do it more often if you need to, and particularly if you get into a situation like we were in a few years ago where the fuel prices were going crazy. Um, uh, let's see, Chris has a question about you. Okay, Excel is a, gr I love using Excel for spreadsheets, um, but when it comes for bookkeeping and money things, I prefer Quicken. Um, or QuickBooks for, for business and it's it's pretty easy to use and there's usually uh, several workshops around the state every year on how to adapt Quicken for a farm-based business and there's a couple of books on the internet that you can buy that will help you use Quicken and set it up for your business. Um, I think it has an awful lot of power. I've used it for several years and I really like it and the time I like it the most is at tax time when I just get to print a couple of reports, uh, take it off to the um, accountant and I'm done. So that's, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not endorsing Quicken, but I am endorsing, you know, any kind of a computer-based accounting program that um, is affordable and will allow you um, to, to do, to, to be a powerful record keeper with as little effort as possible, because I know most of us do not want to spend our days and evenings sitting at computers. Um, okay, so there's a question here on, um, standard markup. I wish there were standard markups, but there's it's all over the market. And generally speaking, it has to do with um, the more value you add, the more room there is for a markup. Um, so the closer to the, the raw product that you're selling, really the less markup there is. Um, and you'll just have to check out what the industry is. Uh, Microgreen prices seem to be wildly different from $17 to more than $100 a pound. Um, how do I figure out what to charge? Well, this is, you know, you're just getting started as I recall and so you might not have actual production numbers. Uh, it's going to be really important for you to keep really good production records as you go. A couple things are going to happen um, and this is very common for uh, folks that are just getting started. One is, is that you're less experienced so you're not as efficient as you're going to be a few years down the road and the other thing is, is that quality uh, may be a problem. You will you will have to work harder to get a higher quality. And again, it's just a, a function of time and experience. And we all get better as we do things more often. Um, what I would do is um, well, first of all, I would throw out the high and the low and I would shoot for something in the middle. I would do a lot more research on what people are selling and who they're selling and again it goes back to trying to, to um, find people who are as close to the market that you intend to be in as possible. So for example if you're selling an organic product compare your prices to somebody who's selling an organic product. If you're selling at uh, through a CSA find somebody who's selling through a CSA. If you're selling at a farmer's market, find people who are selling at farm stands or farmers markets rather than at co-ops and things because that's where you're likely to find it. Now having said all that, I'm also going to tell you the sorry truth which is most most of the people that are out there selling right now in farmers markets are probably not doing what I just advised you all to do around pricing. So there are an awful lot of people out there who, as I said earlier, uh, figure out what their price is by running through the co-op or heading to the uh, market and seeing what their competitors are charging and then assuming that that'll work. Now that only works if your competitors that you're copying um, are, are actually figuring out what their costs are. And again, remember that there's no two farms that are going to have the same cost. So for example, um, in my family, my family raises turkeys for the Thanksgiving and Christmas market. Well, they can get a turkey to market for much less than the neighbors down the road because they've been doing it for 50 years. Um, the farm and the land is paid off, the equipment is paid off, um, all of the processing equipment has been fully amortized. So, um, you know, so, so their cost is incredibly low compared to somebody who's brand new who is paying off a huge mortgage at a high interest rate. Um, and so those are sort of some ethical considerations in pricing. 
Um, okay, and then so I broke all the rules in my first year. I undercharge in sales to my friends. I'll probably lose some of their sales if I raise my prices, but I, ex I suspect some of them will enjoy learning how I pull this off and the cost behind the product is that your experience. It is absolutely my experience that um, if people don't want to pay a fair price for the product, they probably are not the kind of customers you want to spend your time on anyway. There are customers out there, there are plenty of them in this state that are willing to pay a fair price for a quality product. It's your challenge to figure out what that price is and then go out there and find those customers and um, it's possible to do. I work with farmers every day that do it. Um, is there a standard percentage of profit you should use when determining price? No, unfortunately, again, it really depends on what you're producing. Um, if you are a cheese producer, and I know there are a couple folks on here that are producing cheese, I would strongly encourage you to get involved with the association. Uh, if you're involved, if you're selling meat, I would involve you, um, advise you to get involved with um, one of the, the associations that's most closely um, aligned to what you're selling because those are the places where you can figure out sort of what is the state, you know, what kinds of profit are people actually tacking on and what, you know, how is that working for them. Part of it is going to be um, truthfully whether most of your cost is variable or most of your cost is fixed. Um, if you've got, because, and the, and the reason I say that is because absolutely positively you've got to recover your variable cost. You've got to. If you can't cover those, you really can't take that product to market. Your fixed costs are a little bit more negotiable, but over the long run you're going to need to recover some of those. So I wish it were easier. I wish I had a little formula that I could just tell you to plug it in here and out will pop the price, but unfortunately it just doesn't work that way. Um, how do you account for equipment upgrades in your product pricing structure? Um, so I'm going to guess, Chris, that you're asking about like when you buy a new piece of equipment. Um, and what I usually do is first of all is amortize it over a few years. Um, and it, how many years depends on what the product is and what I think its life expectancy is, but minimally five years and up to even 10 or 15 years for bigger pieces of equipment. Um, and again, it goes back to what's the percentage of time that that particular piece of equipment is being used on your particular product. So if, for example, if you have, um, uh, say you have three profit centers in your business, um, and this piece of equipment is used most heavily in um, one of them, then you're going to want to assign more of the cost for that particular piece of equipment to that product and less to the others. Hopefully that makes some sort of sense. It didn't sound very logical as I was saying it. Uh, would you ever suggest reducing the product price toward the end of the marketing day? No. Um, I, I don't. I've seen this happen a lot in the markets and I'll tell you what it does in my opinion is it trains the customers to come at the end of the market day. Uh, because they're very clever that way and they say, oh, well, if she always reduces her price after 2 o'clock, then why would I go at 11 o'clock and pay more when I can show up at 2 o'clock and pay less? Um, it also, um, you know, what you can do toward the end of the market day. Yes, gotcha. Um, what you can do, and this is a, um, this, this is a sort of a, a common issue for people and I, I'd be willing to bet that some of you wrestle with this, which is that the price you have to charge for your product is more than some of your own friends and family could pay for it. And so you're probably thinking, well, how in the world can I, you know, it's my value that I want to produce safe, healthy food and I want to feed it to the people in my community. 
um, you know, but the price isn't working out, so how can I do that? Well, there's a couple things. One is, is that there's no rule that says you have to charge every customer the same price for your product. So by that I mean um, you don't get to pick and choose on market day from customer A and customer B, but if you're selling in more than one outlet, you absolutely can adjust your prices. Um, and the best example is um, a young farmer that I was working with who lived in Rutland County and was selling at both the Rutland market and the Middlebury market and the Burlington market and was selling all of the stuff um, at the same price. Even though she was actually, on the day she went to Burlington, she was adding over two hours to her day and a lot of miles on her um, on her um, vehicle. So, you know, it, and she was curious about how you would actually justify that. And I was like, how would you justify not? The actual cost is more for you to sell it in Burlington than it is in Rutland. So it's perfectly fine for you to do that. Um, there are other ways that you can help your community. You can always donate to Food Shelf. You can donate to your local schools. You can donate to your senior centers. Um, there's, you can have bulk pricing so that uh, if you want customers to, uh, local customers to be able to afford your products, you can offer things like um, canning, canning specials, bulk specials. Um, you can package things. So if you're selling meat, and one of the things that you're hap um, that is happening is um, that you know the choice cuts get snapped up right away, and then there's some other cuts. Um, you know, usually the organ meats that hang around. Um, try creating sort of packages uh, that you sell at a single price. That is sort of, um, and that helps you to move more product as well. Uh, what about reducing prices at the end of the season? Um, it's still not a practice that I really like to do for the same reason that I don't like to see prices reduced at the end of the day. Um, and it, But I do, you know, when there is a glut of something on the market, I mean, let's face it, when it's July, the end of July and August and, um, you know, people are putting this piling zucchini in their front yard with absolutely free signs on it, um, you're going to probably have to do something to to reduce the price a little bit. However, um, I would caution you against doing it too much. I would I would almost rather see you donate it to a local food shelf um, or to a gleaning project and take the tax write off than I would see you sell it at a loss. But that's my personal opinion, and I think that somebody else could make a compelling argument for um, a different a different way. So um, any other questions, comments? Anybody have words of wisdom? If not, um, that's it for tonight. And I do want to invite you quickly to, I will put this, uh, I'm going to put up a link here in the text box, I hope. Oh. Whoops. Um, That link will take you to where our survey is. Are the recordings of the previous webinars? Yes, we've only done one previous one, but they are. It is up, and um, it's in the same place as the link to this one will be. And we do offer them every month, same uh, time, same place, second Thursday at seven o'clock. And as I said earlier, uh, next month we're going to have um, a chef from Necky and from Vermont Fresh Network talking about selling to restaurants and being able to sort of tap into that market and considerations. After that, we're going to um, have one on uh, pasturing, basic pasturing. In just in time for the beginning of the pasture season, we hope, fingers crossed. 
Uh, and then I've forgotten, honestly, but um, we've got a good lineup going. So I hope you'll be able to join us for more. Um, we do record them. So if you're busy and you can't make it, um, check out the recordings. But I'm sure nothing compares to the live experience. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, Lucy, break even. Uh, shoot me an email and I'll send you some worksheets. I'm going to post them with the, along with this presentation and a few other things. So it was great chatting with you guys. Um, have a great evening, and I hope we see you again.